Welcome to Facebook Live on RTV6 as we continue our coverage of coronavirus in Indiana. We're joined this morning by Dr. Cole Beeler. He's the Medical Director of Infection Prevention at IU Health University Hospital here in Indianapolis. Thank you for coming. We should probably do the right that or we could do the leg thing or we could do the disco bump. We'll have to figure that out. Sure, I'm excited. What is the current state? Uh, we know that we have a number of cases already reported through our, throughout our state, but as far as you see it, mm -hmm. Put add some perspective to this issue. So I think right now we're still learning a lot about how Indiana is going to be affected. Uh, we've seen at least four cases now. My guess is that these are going to continue to come in and we'll see cases escalate as our diagnostic tests become more available. I think we'll learn a lot more about this as the test becomes available and we'll really get a good understanding of how much coronavirus is out there. So I want to point out that as you join us on Facebook Live, you know the routine. The doc is an expert on this issue. We hope that you'll join on our conversation. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. At when, you know, when someone feels ill, I, I guess the concern here is with the flu, right? Mm -hmm. Do I have the flu or do I have this thing called coronavirus COVID-19? Mm -hmm. How do I know and what do I do so that I don't infect other people and act appropriately? Yeah. Um, Flu or coronavirus, kind of the guidance is the same. Uh, you want to avoid large groups of people so that you don't pass the disease on. You want to make sure you cover your mouth, cover your sneeze, wash your hands. Uh, these are what we call kind of general horizontal measures of infection prevention to protect yourself and your loved ones. Because uh, you're exactly right. I mean, this is a disease process that's very similar to the flu. COVID and flu have overlapping symptomatology, meaning that they're going to present very similar. Uh, flu tends to hit you a little bit faster and a little bit harder than COVID does, um, which tends to drag on and may have milder symptoms, at least to start out. Um, but it's very confusing for even physicians to be able to tease out what might be or what might not be COVID. So right now we're really hanging our hat on any sort of travel history or any sort of exposure to areas that have known to have, uh, have been known to have COVID. So travel outside the United States, but also even within the United States, certain areas and conferences that have had known um, uh, cases are risk factors. We don't want to create a panic. We want to deal just with the facts to avoid any kind of fear. If I don't feel well, mm -hmm. if I think I have the flu, mm -hmm. do I call 911? Do I call my doctor and say, hey, I think I'm sick? How do I act so that I don't infect people by mistake or, you know, I don't want to be that person? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, there are certainly indications to call 911 if you are critically ill. For instance, um, you're not able to talk, you're not able to speak, you're not conscious, you have severe shortness of breath, and 911 is appropriate. But in general, we're trying to reduce the amount of times that we're using ambulances and reduce the amount of ER visits associated with this. So if you have a general mild illness, which is very common at this time of year, what I would recommend would actually be to call your physician's office, describe your symptoms. They're going to know you much better than an emergency doc would. They know your other medical problems and they can help guide you as to what the next steps are. Do you need testing? Uh, they can get in touch with uh, infection prevention at the closest hospital, but also talk to the health department that's local to help really decide what the best management is for your particular case. We've had one school district shut down in Avon. Mm -hmm. So now what do those people do, right? Because the whole point of that is to keep people sort of separated so that we don't sneeze on each other or cough or get each other sick. No one wants that. Right. So then what do I do while I'm in sort of this self quarantine? What do I stay home? I yeah. mean, how do I limit my activity so that the very thing I want to avoid, which is spreading the disease, doesn't happen? Yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough situation to be self quarantined. But uh, unfortunately, the recommendation is to stay as isolated as possible um, for the entire time that you are that you need to be in self quarantine, which if infected should be guided by the health department. That means sitting in your room, watching TV, um, you know, eating appropriately resting, uh, doing all the things that your body probably needs to do to heal up as fast as it can with any sort of viral infection. Uh, the important things is that if you are in self-quarantine for whatever reason is that you aren't going to those crowded areas. You really aren't mingling with a whole bunch of people because since you are infected, we don't want to expose other people and we don't want this thing to bro blow out in the community around you. Let's talk about our city. Indianapolis is a convention city. Uh, the Big Ten, mm -hmm. uh, sporting events, all those kinds of things. What do I do? Is this a situation where I have to determine the risk level? And again, this is not about creating a panic. There's no mm -hmm. reason not to be around people, but you want to minimize, right, the interaction. So how do we go about comporting ourselves? Do we say, oh, I'm not going to do that? Mm -hmm. Because if we do that, don't we just 
society comes to a screeching halt then, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, certainly it's not a time to panic, but it's a time to be um, respectful for the virus and allowing the data to come out, not exposing yourself to things that you could avoid. So um, the patients that I would be most concerned in that setting would be patients who have a chronic medical conditions. So chronic problems with your heart, with your lungs, diabetes, problems with the immune system. Those are patients that I might counsel to say, hey, maybe don't go to those sporting events. Uh, maybe avoid travel. Um, the reason why is because those patients seem to be at higher risk for bad things happening when they get infected. So most patients do just fine. About 80% of patients uh, have mild or no symptoms with infection. Um, but it's the patients who have other problems wrong already that tend to get sicker and die from this. So in this convention city, I would highly recommend talking to your doctor about if this would be safe for you to go to. We want to go to some of the questions as you join us live here on Facebook Live. We're being joined this morning by Dr. Cole Beeler. He is the Medical Director of Infection Prevention at IU Health University Hospital here in Indianapolis. A couple of questions. This is from Amanda Michelle. Can you have the flu and coronavirus simultaneously? Or are those is, two different things? Yeah, it is uh, theoretically possible. Now, influenza, which causes flu, um, is a separate virus. It's a separate, complete family of viruses. It just has a pretty similar um, symptom uh, spectrum. Um, it is rare, as far as we know right now, for patients to have two viral infections at once. Uh, but again, uh, all the statements I'm making are based on local data from where there's been previous outbreaks, usually outside the United States. So we're still really trying to understand how the American population behaves. I would say it would be rare for the American, the average American in Hoosier to have two viruses at once. Uh, Sarah Bollinger wants to ask you, what degree of fever does a person have to have if they have the coronavirus? Is, is, there, a is there a difference in degree between a regular fever, a flu, or a coronavirus? Mm -hmm. So almost all patients have fevers greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Tipton uh, Scanner wants to know, how long does the COVID-19 lay dormant, if at all, on material items we touch? We don't have a great answer for that right now. Um, it could be anywhere up to two hours. Um, I think that's probably an overestimate, uh, but that is what we are implementing in our hospital to be safe. So if, you're, if we have a patient in a room that has coronavirus uh, that doesn't have um, negative pressure ventilation, we're usually keeping that room quiet um, and not allowing people in uh, for two hours to allow it to kill itself um, or to die on the dry surfaces. Um, with negative pressure, uh, I think that it's a lot less time because this uh, virus should be getting um, ventilated. In the community, um, I would apply the same thing probably two hours, but it's important to keep clean uh, the areas that are what we consider high touch bathrooms, sinks, doorknobs, handles. Make sure you're wiping those down on a regular basis. And Natalie Wheatley wants to know, what are the risks to pregnant women? As far as we know right now, um, there's only a theoretical risk to pregnant women. They are technically um, uh, immunocompromised, meaning that their immune system is not all the way normal. That said, there have been no studies to my knowledge that have shown that they are, uh, that infection during pregnancy is associated with poor outcome for the mother or the fetus. Amy Hyman wants to know, how long do symptoms usually take before they appear? Which I think would be the big question, right? right. If you're right. walking around, how do you know and how long will it take before you say, I think I'm sick? Yeah. Uh, the median time to symptom duration is five days, but it can be as long as two weeks. Um, most patients, it's going to be within a week after exposure. It's important to uh, know that we don't have strong evidence that people start shedding virus during that asymptomatic incubation period, we call it. Um, as far as we know, those patients should not be able to infect others. A, a corollary to that is that as soon as you start developing symptoms, it's probably appropriate to start trying to isolate yourself, talking to your boss, protecting others around you. What should people that work with the public do? So if you're a taxi cab driver, if you have to, if that's your job, mm -hmm. to be out there, out and about, talking to people, what, how do you, how do you handle yourself so A, you don't, uh, you're not offensive, but at the same time you're safe and you keep other people safe? Yeah, I think um, this is a major area that we get a lot of questions about, and unfortunately uh, there is not a whole lot that you can do job-wise to avoid these contacts. So uh, what we recommend is really making sure that you keep appropriate distance between you and whoever you're working with. About a six-foot radius um, is probably what's needed between you and another person to be able to transmit. So give yourself a nice healthy distance, avoid contact wherever possible, use consistent hand hygiene every time you touch someone else, um, making sure that uh, patients cover their, or sorry, that people cover their mouth and cover their sneeze um, uh, when they're sick. We have a viewer question which says, can the coronavirus live 
on a cell phone for nine days? Do we even know how long the virus or any virus can live on a on, a, on, a, on an object? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it, I, I'm at least not aware of any studies that show that it can last that long. And in general, viruses tend to dry up pretty quickly once they hit a surface. So that would be news to me. I'd be very surprised if it was able to last that long. Um, it's even rare for bacteria to be able to last that long on surface. Um, as far as my knowledge goes so far, I don't think that's possible. So I go to the ER or I go to my clinic, they know mm -hmm. I'm coming, yeah. and I think that I have the COVID-19. Yeah. What does that testing look like? Yeah. What do you do with me? How does that, do you put me in a, a space suit? I mean, what does that look like so that I know what to anticipate? Yeah, so um, the, the first thing that I would mention is that uh, most of our clinics in Indiana are not set up to do testing. The reason why is because testing right now, according to the CDC, has to happen in a negative pressure room that are really only present in hospitals. So what we're trying to do when we are made aware of someone that has suspicious symptoms for coronavirus is bring them into the emergency department where we do have negative pressure rooms and we can safely test. When they arrive to the hospital, there's usually a communication that happens before they physically get into the hospital. The patient's usually met outside with a mask. They're escorted to the room. The triage process goes on inside that negative pressure room and the testing happens in that negative pressure room. And almost everyone is probably, well, the ma majority of patients are gonna be discharged after that test is collected. Um, if you meet criteria for admission, you would then get moved up into the hospital proper in a negative pressure room. Is it a blood test? It is a nose swab and a mouth swab. And how long do you have to wait for the results to come back? I mean, are you in that room until something comes back and says positive or negative? Yeah, unless you're sent home. So you can self-quarantine at home, in which case you don't need to be in one of those special rooms. If you're staying in the hospital, you need to remain in that negative pressure room until we get a negative COVID screen. Um, those tests, it depends on when you send it during the day because they're generally batched um, and uh, it can be probably anywhere between a few hours to 24 hours. We're getting ready to move the test in-house, meaning that we'll be performing the test at IU Health for patients who meet criteria uh, for testing and that's going to be around a 24 hour turnaround time. If I test positive and you bump me up, mm -hmm. where am I going to? And how long am I there? Am I there for 14 days? It, it just depends on uh, whatever it is that you need supportive wise. So uh, what we expect to see is patients uh, that need to be admitted will probably be admitted because they've got a pneumonia. As soon as you start feeling better from your pneumonia, we'll discharge you to home. And then you can be managed by the public health department once you get home as far as when you're safe to come out of quarantine. Now, uh, we're talking about a lot of folks telling them to self-quarantine if they think, mm -hmm. but how do I know that's safe though? How do I, as, uh, I'm just a TV reporter. I don't have a medical degree. Sure. If I think I feel good, so what? I mean, do I need to get checked out by somebody to say, Raphael, yes, you're okay. I mean, how do I verify that yeah. what I think I'm saying is true? As far as we know, symptoms are pretty reliable for this so far. So uh, fever, shortness of breath, cough, if you don't have any of those, um, I wouldn't recommend imposing a self-quarantine unless you have extremely high risk exposure, which should really be guided by your primary physician who knows you the best. Um, and can be uh, counseling can be sought by local health departments and infection prevention teams. Um, I would not recommend necessarily self-quarantining automatically. I would recommend people going on and doing their lives. Um, as soon as you start feeling sick though, uh, that changes the situation where I would definitely pursue guidance on what the best thing is to do. Because of HIPAA rules, we know that a lot of information cannot be shared with the public. Right. But are you folks in the medical field, are you getting all the data so that you understand what is happening behind the veil? Because I understand that we in the media, people at home, they want more information. But are you getting more information so that you're able to make a better diagnosis as you move forward? Yeah, so um, there, we have been sharing information uh, that is not protected health information uh, regarding the general scenarios with the other hospitals that have received coronavirus so far. Um, and we know kind of the gist of what's going on so that we can learn from their experiences. But you're exactly right. We don't have a lot of patient specific information. What we do know related to patient specific information usually comes from outside the United States because there's just been a lot more cases. And the reason I ask that question is we, we were initially told that if you were someone who made contact with someone from China mm -hmm. or Japan or some Iran, right. now Italy, that that was really the nexus, that that was the haha, -ha, it, it came from there. Right. But now that it's here, I'm not getting a lot of information as to wh who, how are we getting this other than it's an airborne kind of thing. So yep. 
how do I protect myself if I don't know what to look out for? Is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, it's 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 very challenging, uh, and what, what you're expressing, I think, is what we're all um, you know struggling with is how, how for sure do we know how to protect the public with this? And I think the things that I mentioned before is just making sure that you avoid areas where sick people could cluster is probably the best advice that I could give you. The symptoms uh, usually are evident um, uh, with patients, and they usually report symptoms. So it's a two-way street. Not only should it be the healthy person's responsibility to avoid crowded areas, but it should also be the sick people responsibility to avoid those areas as well. Dr. Cole Bieler, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Sure. As we continue to discuss the issue of the coronavirus in Indiana, we'll continue to have these discussions on Facebook Live. If you have more questions, continue to put them on there. We'll follow up with him and other medical professionals as we cover the story, providing you with the facts so we can avoid a lot of the things that are just not true out there. So, sir, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate you. We thank you for watching RTV6.